1941, Helmut Hubener, a teenage boy and two friends from his Latter-day Saint branch, began to feel that something wasn't right about the Nazi regime that was being bought into all around them. In fact, they felt it was terribly wrong. Helmut set out to use the only weapon he knew how to operate, a typewriter. Matt Whitaker is a man on a mission to tell Helmut's story. In fact, he has been on that mission for over 20 years. The road to the fulfillment of this dream has not been easy, but Matt recently partnered with Angel Studios, the studio behind The Chosen, and it feels like his dream may soon become a reality. Matt has previously worked on beloved Latter-day Saint films, Saints and Soldiers, as well as two of the Work in the Glory movies. This is All In, an LDS Living podcast where we ask the question, what does it really mean to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm Morgan Pearson, and I am so excited to have Matt Whitaker on the line with me today. Matt, welcome. Thank you, Morgan. So happy to be on here. Well, today we're going to be talking about a project that Matt has now devoted a good chunk of his life to. Matt, you have been working on this project for a very, very long time. Is that right? That is true. Um, Starting way back in 2001. Let's see, what year were you born? Is it okay to ask that? How old were you in 2001? (laughs) Yeah, I was born in 1989, so I would have been 11 or 12 around that time. (laughs) Well, when you were 11 or 12, I was, I was in my thirties and, uh, uh, I was actually, I'm a filmmaker. So I was, I was working on a, a documentary for, uh, PBS about, uh, World War II. And it was about members of the church who had served in World War II. So my dad was a B-24 bomber pilot and I've always been just fascinated and very interested in all things World War II. And, uh, and in this documentary, we were, I was interviewing veterans of World War II, members of the church who were American and and British, uh, but also I was interviewing veterans from the other side who had served in in Hitler's army, who were also at the time members of the church, you know, even when they were serving in the army. And it was just a very, very interesting experience. And while I was kind of immersed in that, a friend of mine that was working on it with me asked if I'd ever heard of a a young German teenager named Helmut Hubner, who in Nazi Germany had, had run a resistance group, led this resistance group of other teenagers. I said, no, I haven't heard of that, but I'm interested. And he said, I think the last surviving member of the group is still alive. And I think he lives about 45 minutes away from us. Should we try and see if we can track him down? I said, heck yeah, man, I am in. And we didn't know how to reach him. So we actually opened up the phone book. We knew his name and we found him in the phone book, called him up and, and I, you know, introduced ourselves and, and asked if he would be open to the idea of having us come and maybe sharing his story. And, and his response was, Yahshua, come on up. And so we, we went up to his home and there sitting in his, his living room, he told a story that has changed the rest of my life. He told a story of his best friend, this 16 year old Helmut Hubener, who they, they knew each other from church. They all went, you know, went to church and another best friend, Rudy Voba, and that Helmut was, was, had already begun writing up and typing up anti-Hitler, anti-Nazi leaflets, and at first by himself was putting them out on the streets of Hamburg at night, which was obviously extremely dangerous. But he recruited his two best friends to join him in that, and they did. And, and Carl shared this incredible story, this, you know, of bravery and courage and, and uh, trauma um, on all these things. And I tell you, I walked out of his house that day, just, just saying to myself, I have to tell this story. I, people need to, more people need to know this story. And so that's, uh, I, I did a, a PBS documentary back in 2002. We shot with him. Uh, we, we actually got a chance to take Carl back over to Germany. So here's this man in his late seventies, back over to Germany. And some of the the places that he lived, even, you know, after they had been arrested, some of the cells that they were held in were still in existence. And to walk into some of these little rooms with the bars in the windows and with him and just the, the feelings and the experiences and the things that he shared, it was just, just really unbelievable. Really uh, sunk, sank deep into my, into my heart. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, and the thing that I love about this whole thing, Matt, is that you did not 
stop at creating this documentary. You have continued to work toward this idea of what was originally going to be a movie and now what hopefully will be a limited series. Um, but I wondered, you know, as I was preparing for this interview and watching some of watching the documentary and watching some of the other materials, I wondered what it was about that first interaction with Carl that left such an impression on you that made you feel like you had to do something with this story. You know, that, that is a, a good question. And I've, and I've, of course, over the years asked myself, you know, especially at times when things were rough, I was like, why am I doing this? Why can't I let this go? You know, what was it about Carl, what Carl told me that day and in subsequent conversations that we had that is that is sunk so deep. And I, and I don't have a perfect answer, but, but one thing that I've realized is that I believe that there is across humanity, this innate deep connection to stories where someone sacrifices their life for a greater good, where they're sacrificing their life to save someone else or, or standing up for something when they know that they're putting their own, you know, we have this desperate, inborn, innate need to live, and yet they're, they're willing to subjugate that to help someone else. And, and Carl's story that he told me about Helmut and, and what Helmut had done, I think reached me and I think reaches all of us on a, on a very deep level. And I even do tie it back, I think, and this is just my opinion, but I think that it ties back to the Savior and that that pre-mortal connection, you know, that, again, from, and this is wonderful, Morgan, to be able to talk about it in this way. I don't, when I'm sitting in meetings in Los Angeles <laughs> with, with producers and things like that, of course, I can't delve into this aspect of it, but I love that I can here. But this, this pre-mortal connection and gratitude that we feel for that person who said, send me, I, I'll do it, you know. And uh, so that, that idea of self-sacrifice, the ultimate self-sacrifice, I think, resonates and echoes throughout humanity. And so when we find those stories, when I hear those stories, man, they resonate deeply with me. And, and I, I believe that that's a big part of, of why... Carl's story that he told me about Helmut and his, you know, and their, and their, their sacrifice that they did for the truth and for what was right, why I can't let it go. Well, I love what you said about being able to talk about this in a way that you can't a lot of the time, because that's one thing that I've told people about this podcast is I, they've said like, you know, are people comfortable talking about their faith? And I usually say the amazing thing is how much you find that these people that oftentimes are working in even more secular work than what you do, Matt, they have this desire to talk about their faith because they don't get to other times. And so I think it's so fun today that we'll have the chance, you know, we'll, we'll make sure that people have the resources that you've shared with me, the documentary so that they can, you know, check that out if they want to. But I think that it's important for people to be able to hear the unique aspects that apply to members of our church as we go through this discussion today. So I wonder if one effective way maybe to allow you to share more of these three boys story would be to have you outline some of the biggest lessons that you feel like the story teaches and maybe why those lessons have resonated so much with you over the time that you've been working on this project. Sure. Yeah, I, I think I have something to say about that. And if I, I may need to give some more context to the story and yeah. share a little bit of what Carl shared with me and to have that firsthand experience. I was hearing from someone who said, you know, I was there, I was with Helmut and we were, we were being chased by the Gestapo <laughs> and, you know, those kinds of things. It was a firsthand experience that he was sharing. But Helmut, you know, grew up in the church there in Hamburg, attended this, this little branch, but they grew up singing the same hymns <laughs> that we have grown up singing. And in fact, that a lot of Christians, you know, and one that Carl mentioned to me was do what is right, let the consequence follow. And, and they grew up singing that. And, and so for Helmut, when, uh, you know, he grew up 
again, just kind of inculcated and surrounded with the propaganda of, of, uh, of Hitler and, and Nazi Germany. And what happened was his older brother, who was also a faithful member of the church and was serving in the German army, had come home from France and he smuggled with him a shortwave radio. And if you know anything about, uh, about that, in, in Nazi Germany, they had what they called the people's radio. And it was a terrible little radio that only got about three stations and you could only hear what Hitler wanted you to hear. Whereas with this shortwave radio, Helmut turned it on and started listening to radio broadcasts from the BBC and from America and uh, from other places. And at that time, the BBC was broadcasting in the German language. And they were broadcasting not propaganda, they were broadcasting the truth and, and intentionally trying to reach out to German citizens who had access to, to shortwave radios to let them know what was really going on. And Helmut heard these and intuitively knew that he was hearing the truth. And I don't fully understand how he gathered that, but Carl, the way Carl explained it is that you listen to the propaganda radio and it was just all, you know, all victories all the time. And the German army was undefeatable. And he was listening, when he listened to the BBC, he would hear victories, but also defeats. And it just sounded, he just realized he was getting a much more full picture than that. And this, this kid who grew up singing, do what is right, let the consequence follow, took that next step. So he didn't just realize, oh, this is true. I'm going to keep listening. He had that courage to say, I have to share this with others. And he was the, in their little branch, he was the branch secretary. And his job was to type letters to the German soldiers from their branch who were serving in the, in the army. Well, he borrowed that typewriter, took it home, and, uh, and started on that church typewriter typing up these anti-Hitler, anti-Nazi flyers. He before that, he was on the Nazi fast track. <laughs> he, was, he, he had a job at the, working for the government at City Hall, had access there to banned books, so banned literature, banned authors like William Shakespeare and Schiller and Heinrich Mann, all these different authors that had been banned. He had access to them in this archive. And so we know that he was reading that. He was listening to the BBC. He was also just putting things together on his own. And so when he started typing up the truth in these flyers, you know, we have copies of some of the flyers that he wrote, and it is unbelievable. He's predicting things that are going to happen, and they did happen. They ended up happening. He's predicting that Germany's going to lose the war at a time when they were dominating. And he would say, this is why. And, uh, and those things happened. So to get back to your question, we see this, you know, he was doing that at night during the week, and then at Sundays he was going to church and he was passing the sacrament and, and participating in this branch. One of the aspects of the story that to me is, is really poignant and, and powerful and, and frankly a little um, nuanced or complex is that the branch president in, their, in that uh, branch in Hamburg, a faithful member of the church, um, had the, the privilege of meeting uh, with two of his sons just a devout member of the church. He was also a devout member of the Nazi party and really, really believed it. And sometimes he would begin the meetings with the, the salute and Heil Hitler. And for some people that just seemed normal and natural. And for other members of the branch, it didn't, it didn't seem right at all. But that was the, that was the environment that, that Helmut was going to church in. And one crucial moment for him he had a friend in the branch who was just a couple years older than he, who his name was Salomon Schwartz. And Salomon was a convert to the church. He was Jewish. And one Sunday they showed up to church and there was a sign that had been put on the door by the branch president that said, Jews not allowed to enter, which of course you saw all over the city by that point. This was in late 30s, early 40s. But they just had that, you know, that one, Zalamon and his sister had joined the church, and those were the only Jews in that branch. And it was traumatic, and, and shortly after that, Zalamon was arrested and, and uh, eventually ended up in a concentration camp. That convergence of, of having the radio and having access to the truth, and, and then having his good friend 
um, have that have him kind of banished from his branch, but also then arrested and taken and disappearing must have been a last straw for him and and was part of the motivation. He he picked up, in my view, he picked up really the only weapon that he knew how to use, and that was a typewriter. You know, he wasn't, uh, by, by all accounts, he wasn't athletic, he wasn't big, he wasn't, you know, he didn't have a gun or any of those things. He had a typewriter, and that's what he started. You know, that's why this, this LDS kid started typing up the truth and, and putting it out. Wow. Well, I want to unpack a couple of those lessons a little bit more and, and kind of highlight a couple of the things that you, you mentioned. It struck me as I was preparing that this is a unique story of friendship. You mentioned that it was like this boy being shut out was what the straw that broke the camel's back. What do you think these boys understood about loyalty that maybe we could benefit or learn from? Carl told me that, you know, because they grew up, they, they were playing together when they were five and six years old. And, uh, and, and by the time that they were teenagers, you know, in, in the church in Nazi Germany at that time, the branch really was kind of, that was your family. It really was this very close. If you, if you've spend any time in some of the small branches or, or wards in a church out in the mission field, as they say, there is a real closeness that, that we may not always experience here along the Wasatch Front, you know, but they had just, they, these two boys that he reached out to were, were family. And, and so there was this, this commitment. Carl said that, that after they had started operating, you know, and started putting out flyers together, they made a pact with each other. They made a promise to each other. And Helmut actually told them, he said, if I ever get caught, um, I will not give up your names. You know, I'll, I'll just take all the blame on me. And that, and that both Carl and Rudy each made that same promise to each other and to him. So uh, it, for me, it's actually beautiful to see this, this little group of, of three boys, three teenage boys, um, involved in something that Yes, must have been exciting on one level, but also they knew it was extremely dangerous what they were doing, but they made this very, very meaningful and important promise to each other that they were going to be loyal to each other, that they were not going to, you know, again, if any one of them got caught, it would end there. That was put to the ultimate test uh, about a year later. To jump forward in the story, so these these boys, this resistance group operated for about a year throughout 1941, and as they started putting out these leaflets, of course the Gestapo, some of them were getting turned in, and the Gestapo was finding them, you know, and 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 reading them. The Gestapo was just convinced that this was a university professor. Whoever was writing these was, you know, some communist university professor or something. And when they finally tracked down. Helmut at his at his office at the beginning of 1942 and arrested him. Again, they arrested. They thought they were just arresting, you know, somebody who was putting them out, but that they were they were, they were going to find out who was the adult behind this, who was writing these. They arrested him on on February 5th, 1942, 80 years ago, and then began to interrogate and torture him for information. And it's interesting because I've read their notes and their records that they took of that interrogation process. I've read the English translations of them. And mm -hmm. um, the Gestapo used terms like, we used assiduous persuasion to convince this young man to share. Well, of course, you know, those are euphemisms for we tortured him and we beat him. Helmut lasted for five days of of keeping completely silent about anybody. But finally, after five days, he did give them the names of his two friends, of Carl and Rudy. He didn't tell them everything. In fact, he told them very little beyond that. And that's why Carl, you know, because right after he gave them their names, Carl and Rudy were arrested and questioned and interrogated and tortured as well. Again, still asking all of them, who are the adults? Who's really behind this? And eventually, they, uh, the Gestapo realized that all of this had been masterminded by this 16-year-old young man. But the fact that he did finally give their names was, I'm sure, um, 
trauma, you know, traumatizing for Helmut that that in that moment he wasn't able to keep keep his his promise. Uh, several months later, he was able to redeem himself, and that's a beautiful part of the story as well. Well, I don't want to give away all the parts of the story, <laughs> but another thing that I wanted to highlight you mentioned the branch president, and obviously that is a complex part of the story, um, especially for Latter-day Saints, when we understand the structure of the church and organization of the church. And I thought it was interesting in the documentary, you talk to a professor who mentions that when he tells this story to his university students, they often are shocked that a member of the church would be part of the Nazi party. And he says, you know, would you be shocked that a a Latter-day Saint is a Republican or a Democrat? Well, that's the way that it felt at that time. You know, it was just, are you part of it or are you not? Um, And so there are some complexities as it relates to this situation. How how would you explain that to those of us that are not quite as well-versed in the nature of the political situation there? Yeah, it, it is shocking for a lot of us when we hear that uh, that this branch president was was a devout Nazi. But I think it's important to remember that this was Nazi Germany. There were Nazis in Nazi Germany, and there were a lot of people. It's I think it's easy for us to look back eighty years and kind of look at things in black and white, where we see you know the evil Nazis and the heroic resistance fighters. And of course, I see what Helmut and his friends did as heroic, but there was this big gray area in the middle for most Germans, and that's where they were making their decisions each day. And they were, you know, they were, they were, they were, they were trying to make decisions based on what they knew and based on, on, you know, living in that place every day. And so I look at this good branch president who again, was was very patriotic. And a lot of members of the church looked at Adolf Hitler, who didn't smoke, and he didn't drink. And he encouraged people to, to search out their family history to do their genealogy, of course, for very dark reasons, um, you know, as proof that they didn't have Jewish ancestry. But he also, he instituted something that, uh, that he called the one pot Sunday, where once a month on a Sunday, once a month, he would encourage people to abstain from meals for two meals and then donate the difference to the poor. So the members of the church were seeing all these things and thinking, you know, especially early on in Hitler's, you know, after he was elected, oh, well, maybe he's, you know, maybe he is. In fact, some of the members of the church really felt that, that he was God's instrument to a point. You know, of course, there was a certain point where most people came to their senses and realized, wait a minute, this is not who we thought this was. But as Carl told me, by then it was too late. By then, if you whispered anything against him to the wrong person, including sometimes family members, that you could end up in a, in a concentration camp. And so to look at someone like this branch president, his name was Arthur Zander. And to, to, I think we can't judge him. And I, and I really, for me, this has kind of been a life lesson because, you know, in our, in our situations in life, we may look at people, whether it's politically and just think, oh man, they are, they are wrong. They are on the, the wrong side of that or, you know, or something, or how could this, how could this bishop or how could this stake president, you know, feel that way politically? How could they have that person's uh, vote for me sign in their yard, you know? And, and I think we all need to, to take a step back and, and just remember that, first of all, having served as a, as a bishop, none of us asked for that calling, you know? Somebody came to us and asked us, and we said, yes, <laughs> gulp, yes. And I know that's what it was for, for Arthur Sonder as well, this branch president. He was a re- fairly recent convert to the church and a loving husband and father, and for a number of years during Hitler's reign was, was, uh, was devout to the cause. If I can talk about the other side of that, though, his, because he was so devout, and of course, especially after Helmut was, was arrested and the boys were arrested, there was all kinds of attention on the, the church, you know, from the, from the Gestapo and from the Nazi party. And so the Gestapo was coming to the church and attending the meetings. And of course, they saw a party man who was 
very much <laughs> a part of the, you know, the Nazi party and very patriotic in that sense. And, and one of the things that Arthur Zonder did very shortly after Helmut was arrested was excommunicated him. And that, um, again, that's something that we just think, wait, that, that just doesn't sound right. And if you jump forward, if you were to after the end of the war, I've actually seen a copy of that excommunication record and the church officially has written over it. It says excommunicated by mistake. And so is essentially his excommunication wasn't even recognized by the church. But the fact that this branch president had done that may very well have saved the members, not only in Hamburg, but, but to potentially across Germany, across Nazi Germany. So for me, it's important to remember that not to pass too quick of judgment on, on this man who, who was operating in a, in a, in a place and at a time that was very, very difficult, very difficult for anyone of faith to try and discern what is right and what isn't. Fascinating to me. I feel like we've touched on a few of these kind of unique Latter-day Saint specific elements that might not be explicitly shown in the series, but that might be interesting for Latter-day Saints to know about. Are there any other little insights into kind of the Latter-day Saint part of this story that you'd like to highlight? Yeah, I'll I'll talk about one and then we can see if that leads to to something else. But one of the things, because every... Every church and every faith in Nazi Germany had to figure out what their standing was, you know, how they were going to, and, and a lot of them really out of survival just kind of went along with it. And, and our faith, our church, the council from Salt Lake was Lilo, <laughs> Lilo, and, uh, and, you know, to, to not, to not cause, cause waves and, and just kind of get through it, really, you know. And we had, of course, our 12th article of faith. We, faith, we believe in being subject to kings, presidents, rulers, and magistrates in obeying, honoring, and sustaining the law. And so a lot of, a lot of members, you know, really just use that as their reasoning to think, okay, well, we have a, we have a, a religious obligation to support our duly elected leader, the Führer, Adolf Hitler. And, and that was their, you know, that was something that was unique to, to our faith and to, and to members of the church. And a lot of them did rely on that, understandably. Now, there were others who also recognized that, you know, throughout the Book of Mormon and, and, and the Doctrine and Covenants, there are also passages that talk about the importance of, of being involved politically and standing up for what is right. But again, there was this really unique, the fact that we, you know, one of the tenets, one of the basic tenets of our faith says to support our kings and rulers and magistrates. Um, And so by and large, members of the church in Germany did that. There were noted exceptions, um, and Helmut is one of those. Matt, I think it's, interesting. And, and one thing that may be important for people to know, because you've talked about, you know, this being excommunicated, dealing with this branch president who was putting signs on the door and saluting prior to church meetings, this boy never lost his faith. Why do you think that this was so firmly embedded in him? That is such a good question, because we know that his mother, who was a member of the church, born and raised in the church, but was not terribly active uh, in the church. She would go sometimes, you know, but her parents were devout and devoted members of the church through and through. And so actually, because uh, his mother had, she'd been married a couple of times and she'd remarried with a man who was a, a part of the Nazi police, the, the SA, they called them, the brown shirts. And he and Helmut did not get along. And so Helmut moved out and moved in with his, his grandparents, who were very faithful and devout members of the church. And, and I'm sure that that had a big impact on, on him holding fast to his faith 
despite all these questions around him, you know, that were going on, despite the things that he was seeing his branch president do. There was another member of the branch who was the counselor in the in the branch presidency by a man by the name of Otto Berndt. And and he was kind of the antithesis of the branch president, if you will. And they got along well, but he was more along Helmut's line. And in fact, after Helmut was arrested and the Gestapo was questioning them and looking at the church and trying to find who was the adult behind this, for a while, they thought for sure it was Otto Berndt, this, this member of the branch presidency. They actually brought him in for questioning. And um, I talked to his son about this a number of years ago when I was doing the documentary. I interviewed his son, and it was just fascinating. And the son of, of this member of the branch presidency who was questioned by the Gestapo, and they kept trying to pin it on him, after he got home, he told his family this. He said, he said they were throwing questions at me just repeatedly and trying to trip me up and trying to get me to contradict something that I've said before. And then he said, and then something took over and the spirit just filled my mind. And I answered all of their questions for over two days straight, all of their questions clearly and consistently until the, it came to the point where the Gestapo realized that he had nothing to do with it and, and released him. And he said that as he was walking out, he had the courage to say to them, do you believe me now that I had nothing to do with what these boys did? The Gestapo said, we do believe you. If we had the slightest doubt, you wouldn't be leaving here alive. And then they said, but remember this, as soon as we've solved the Jewish problem, you Mormons are next. And that was the last thing he heard from them as he, as he left. Now, wow. It's, you know, that that's, sends a chill down all of our, <laughs> all of our spines. I, I think it's important to point out that, that that wasn't, that was one Gestapo agent who said that to him. And it wasn't necessarily the view of, of the Nazi party, although they were watching our church. They, they, you know, they saw it as this American church who was the enemy. And so they were carefully watching members of the church across, across Nazi Germany. But I'll never forget that experience hearing from the son of the man who, who had it. Wow, that's amazing. Pretty wild to think about. So one thing that struck me in one of the videos that I watched that's been filmed more recently, as you all have been working on trying to turn this into a series, someone talked about how this is a story that needs to be told now. And so I wondered, what is it about this story that you feel makes it an important story for our time right now? Having been at this as long as I have, over 20 years. Back 20 years ago, when we first started thinking, we're going to make a movie out of this, it felt like, wow, this is a story that, that really applies to our day today. This, this needs to be told now. From where I sit right now with what's going on in the world, with a, a war again in, in Europe, and, uh, and seeing what is happening, it does feel to me like it's more important now to tell this story than maybe it ever has been. As I look at what, when a, when a dictator has invaded another country and, and seeing how he's, you know, shut down their ability to receive radio broadcasts, you know, cut, you know taken control of all of their, their t- television and radio networks. It's really interesting that, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that the BBC during the World War II was broadcasting in the German language so they could send the truth, you know, on shortwave to those people who couldn't get it. They stopped that after the war and for decades weren't doing it. Last year, or excuse me, earlier this year, they started broadcasting on shortwave again in Russian and in Ukrainian. And, and I just see that as this, this parallel. There's, you know, in some senses, I feel like, okay, it's happening again. And there are, there are Ukrainians and there are Russians who have access to shortwave who are getting their truth the same way that Helmut did 80, 81 years ago. So speaking of that, I do want to try to drive people on the website that you all have created on the Angel Studios website. It has a really good, I feel like, also breakdown of why telling this story 
can benefit young people and seeing this story where these teenagers are standing up for what they believe in. I found it really inspiring. So I think that as well is another reason that this story matters and is particularly timely right right now. Matt, you first began working on this, like we said, over two decades ago, but you felt like it should be a movie and you started working on a script and you've experienced setback after setback after setback. What is it that has kept you moving forward? Yeah, that's a great question because yes, we, we wrote a script and in fact, uh, my writing partner, Ethan Vincent and I wrote a script and you know, it ended up being a really good script for a two hour movie, you know, that someone would go to the theaters and, and, uh, and watch and, and in the mid two thousands, it was, we were getting a lot of good, of good attention. We were, we had two Academy Award nominated actors that said, okay, we're on board this, uh, this young actor, this teenage actor, who at the time was arguably the best actor of his generation, and another older actor who is also almost indisputably the best actor of his generation, both signed on to star in this film. And things were really just looking, you know, like, okay, we're going to get this made. And then in uh, 2008, the the world housing market collapsed, and the economy collapsed, and all of these investors that we had pulled out. And that was, that was really tough. And, uh, but we you know what we took us a while, but we regrouped and said, okay, we're, we're not going to let this stop us. We're going to make this movie. And, and we're at it for a number of years, trying to rebuild the investments and, and we're getting, getting those back and, and getting things coming together. And then of course, COVID hit <laughs> and the world shut down and particularly the film, film business just kind of shut down completely. But once again, our investors pulled out their money it was during that time, actually, when we had our, our first meeting with Angel Studios. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Angel Studios, but they're the ones who, who brought us The Chosen, uh, the incredibly powerful series about Jesus Christ. And we, we sat down and met with them, and we kind of pitched them this story, and they got really excited. They had seen the documentary, and they said, yes, we love this story. We think that, that we could really find great success with this, but we don't think it should be a a one-off movie. We think it should be a series. And my initial reaction, frankly, was, no, I think we've got a really good script and this is going to be a movie. The interesting thing is, is that as that meeting continued, about 10 minutes later, for me, in my mind, just something just clicked. And suddenly I saw this story that had for years been a two-hour movie. I saw it as a four-part episode. I could just see it clearly. I saw episode one and how it ended. I saw episode two and this cliffhanger. I saw episode three. I saw the climax in episode four, all while we're sitting in there in this meeting. And of course, I'm not saying anything out loud, but I left there going, they're right. This is the way to tell this story is as a four-part limited series, what we used to call the mini series, you know? And I went home and started immediately writing a new script, four new scripts. <laughs> Didn't tell my partners actually even until I was finished with them and then gave them to them and said, I sure hope you guys like this because I think we need to do this. And thankfully they did. And, um, and we partnered up with Angel Studios and are moving forward now to, to shoot these, you know, shoot this limited series and tell this story and be able to go into a lot more depth into, for instance, the story of the branch president and his family and his, the moral uh, decisions that he was forced into and trying to trying to navigate and and also diving into the story of the Gestapo agent who who you know was obsessed with hunting down whoever was putting out these flyers his story is amazing <laughs> on its own so all of these things that we get to dive into as we as we approach this story not as a 2 hour movie but as a a four part limited series through you know with the, with uh, Angel Studios well, I love the way that you described that moment in the meeting where you could see it clearly broken out because I've had moments like that with this podcast where like, you know, it'll be an interview won't be going the way that I expected it to. And very clearly I'll have like this moment where I can see the way that if I just make a slight shift, things will be different. And so anyway, I, I love that story. Um, do you, I'm curious 
as you approach trying to, to make this into a series, do you already have people in mind for the starring roles who will play the main characters? Another really good question. Um, you know, as I mentioned in the past, we have gone down that road, gone way down that road to where we had auditioned actors. It's interesting because we way back in 2006, kind of in, you know, version two, version 1.0, as we were moving forward with this, we went over to London, we're cast most of the cast out of London and uh, went over to London, had, you know, a lot of casting sessions there and seeing all these wonderful actors. It's interesting. As I look back at our records there, we had, you know, we were seeing these, these unknown, but wonderful young British actors like, Oh, Robert Pattinson and uh, Andrew Garfield, <laughs> you know, some of these who at the Crazy. time were, were unknown, but of course now have, have done well. So we've been way down that road. This time, we've decided to approach it a little differently, where we're going to wait until we're completely funded, and that's the process that we're in right now, and and then re, you know begin again that casting process to find those actors. I can't tell you how many times over the years that I've said, okay, now this is the actor that I want to play Helmut. You know, and then a couple of years would go by and then he's too old. So it's like, okay, now this is the new young actor that I want to play Helmut. So we're, we're a little circumspect right now and are just kind of holding back. And uh, we, we believe that within the next few months, we'll really begin that casting process in earnest and, uh, and find these wonderful British actors to portray these roles of Helmut and his two best friends and the Gestapo agent and the branch president and his family, all of these parts. What would it mean to you, Matt, to finally have the opportunity to tell this story in the way you've envisioned for over two decades? Yeah, I actually have a hard time talking about that <laughs> because it has been so close to my heart. And, and I do have to say that I wouldn't be sitting here talking with you about that I'm still on this journey if it weren't for my sweet companion, my beautiful wife, you know. 20 years ago, 21 years ago, when we started making the documentary, she was just all in, you know, just so, so supportive. And then I had an experience in 2005. And I guess, okay, I guess this is a venue where I can share that if that's all right. I was actually at the temple and, and had been through a session and was praying and asking for direction on other areas of my life. And for some reason, I hadn't planned on it, but I just kind of asked this question, what about this Helmut Hubner movie? We'd been working on the script and had actually had a, a, an, a, loss, a big LA producer attached and he had somebody else to direct it and I was just going to be screenwriter with my writing partner. And sitting there in the temple, I had one of those strong, strong responses that said, you need to make this movie. You need to direct this. And... And it was so overwhelming and filled with light. And I just received all kinds of direction on next steps to take. I went home and, and sat down with my wife and told her what had just happened and, and said, you know, I kind of warned her. I said, you know, hon, this could take a couple years. <laughs> well, you know, 17 years later, she has been a just completely loyal. You talked about, you know, loyalty earlier. It is so overwhelming to me to see when I have been at times ready to quit and ready to just say, forget it. You know, the Lord can't expect, can't expect us to keep going after this many years, you know, and we're almost there and then everything falls apart and we have to start all over again. And, and I'm ready to, you know, in the proverbial fetal position saying, what have I done? And there's my sweetheart saying, we're still making your movie, right? We're still going to make that movie. And so after all these years, and now we see ourselves on the cusp of actually being able to tell this story, to make this movie, I'm grateful for that, yes, I get to, to finally be able to do what I've wanted to do so badly and felt directed to do, but I'm also so grateful that my sweet wife will be able to see this, see this happen and see where her faith and her sustaining support and her leadership, frankly, in in keeping us moving forward, will finally come to fruition. I'm I'm so grateful. 
What a sweet tribute to your wife. She sounds like my kind of lady. So I would like to meet her. Matt, my last question for you, and and thank you so much for being willing to share your journey and this story and all of the hard work that you've put into this. My last question for you is, what does it mean to you to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? So because my wife and I love your show, I, I knew this question was coming. And it's interesting that I had to really ask myself, yeah, what does that mean to me? I think it means two things. And one is, for me, being all in is remembering Jesus, that this is his work and that we are surrounded with incredible women and men who, as I mentioned earlier, are called into leadership positions in the church and in their beautiful imperfections are just trying to be like Jesus. And so for me, an important part of being all in is keeping that in mind and being loyal and understanding of bishops and Relief Society presidents and all of these these people around us who didn't ask for that position, but who said yes when someone else asked them and are trying their best. Having been a bishop now, I, I, have, I, I just see that, that that is very important to me, and that is a part for me of being of being all in. And the other quick part of this is for me, being all in means that we look around at other members of the church and remember that we are all in. Having been a bishop in a in a young married student wars with these wonderful young Gen Zers and young millennials who just exude love and welcome. And and they were this example to me of what it means to be all in because they didn't it didn't matter if someone showed up who was, you know, covered in tattoos or piercings or who smelled like cigarette smoke or who was gay or transgender. It didn't matter. What they said was, You're welcome here. All are welcome. And I think that for me is also a very important part of what it means to be all in. Thank you so much, Matt. Well, it has been a pleasure to talk with you and good luck. Thank you so much, Morgan. It's been it's been great to talk with you. And now I finally have great street cred with my wife because I'm on her favorite podcast. <laughs> Big thanks to Matt Whitaker for joining us on today's episode. You can learn more about truth and conviction and how you can help make this series a reality by visiting invest.angel.com slash truth. Thanks to Derek Campbell of Mix It Six Studios for his help with this episode. And thank you so much for listening. We'll be with you again next week.